Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Judy Chan. I'm an education consultant with the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology. And I'm here today with Hailan. Hailan, would you like to introduce yourself? Okay, um, I'm Hailan, Hailan Chen. Uh, I'm learning designer with uh, CTLT. So I'm most involved in um, many any projects uh, working with uh, across campus in different faculties to help uh, faculty design courses uh, uh, either online, blended, or face to face. Thank you, Judy. Welcome. I'm going to say this again. I am joining um, from my home in South Vancouver, that is in the unceded ancestral and traditional lands of four different people from four different nations, Muslim, Squamish, um, Stereoaktu, and, and I would like to say, I feel like Coast Salish people, the four people. Um, sorry, I'm just so mindful that a few of you have been in my other workshop this week. Uh, this is my time for me to reflect on my relationship to home um, in my home area just because around me in my neighborhood, there's no signage, there's nothing. Yeah, there's just like in South Vancouver, there's just no indigenous community and there's nothing around me. Um, so I, I really want to use this opportunity to think about my relationship here as a parent, as a first generation immigrant, how I, what can I do to preserve the tradition, the history, to understand it first and then to preserve it and then help my own children to understand um, our relationship with the land, with our everyday actions. Um, so I, I, I invite you to also join me to think about that for um, in your everyday life. Um, so it's just a beautiful totem pole right next to the forestry buildings on campus at UBC Vancouver. Um, here is the agenda for the session. So we are going to review some online assessment principle. Okay. We will start with just assessment principle and then moving on to online. We will look at some UBC examples um, with the focus on authentic assessment. Authentic in this context means um, Highline is going to talk about authentic, authentic assessments, but some examples of what faculty members at UBC are doing and trying. And then we will get into some breakout group activities later where you will share and chat among yourself because I think there's so much. For example, I haven't, I haven't seen this Russian, the language example before, but perhaps some of you will have some ideas um, that can offer to Vita. So we will get into small group sharing. And then we will also touch on ideas on how to promote and introduce academic integrity that Vita asked about. And um, at the end, we will share some quick, briefly introduce you to some technology and resources where you can find additional information. Okay. And then um, I'm going to pass this over to Highland because I am the host of this Zoom session. So Hainan is going to tell me when to go move to the next slide. So it may not be as smooth as it should be, but um, Hainan will tell me when to advance. So Hainan, over to you. Okay, thank you, Judy. Um, so um, yeah, before we dive into some examples, uh, let's review some um, online assessment principles. Um, before we present any content, actually, uh, we would like to know uh, what do you know uh, before we present any uh, content. Uh, so uh, we have some ideas, but uh, we would like to gather some of your thoughts here. Uh, so now you could, uh, in, we invite you to use the annotation tool again uh, to share with us uh, your, some of your specific strategies you might currently using for your class. Um, so we are aiming to get about uh, 10 to uh, um, five to 10 uh, entries uh, before we move on. Yeah, so how about use the annotation text tool as highlighted uh, in the bar on the top there. Uh, can you find your um, annotation tool? Yeah, it should be on the top. 
um, if you don't see that, you might see a more option on on the top of your navigation. I mean, uh, the, the the top there's a black bar there, and uh, you can choose annotation and then choose text. Yeah, we give you a couple of more minutes here. We hope we have some interest here before we move on. Okay, hey, I see some coming in here. So um, we see for some formative assessment, um, some of you have, uh, have some activities for discussions, group presentations, um, and assignments. Um, yeah, uh, for, for, for the summative strategies, this is, there's an exam, right? Um, and uh, uh, we see low stake quizzes uh, followed by a later an exam, right? Uh, so these are, I suppose, is the formative type of assessment. Uh, yeah, you can resize your font or replace. Uh, yeah, uh, so thank you so much <laughs> for making it clear for reading on the screen. Uh, yeah, so uh, oh, some of you are thinking about simulation, uh, stimulating the final exam uh, uh, for learning process progress test. Uh, okay, yay. All right, so quite some ideas over there. All right, any more entries? So these are some of the, uh, uh, oh, I, I see that they're uh, down at the bottom, they're scaffolded assignments, right? So that is a, probably a kind of a milestone type of assignments and then uh, you target uh, help student to find uh, to do some final projects over there. So that's a pretty good idea as well. Okay, so uh, with that, we move on with some uh, review of the principles probably here, right? So uh, when thinking about online assessment, we would recommend uh, consider the assessment as any means of the following. Um, evaluating your student achievements, uh, providing feedback, or even just moving your student forward um, in their learning process. So the assessment, as you, you put the, some examples of there, it can be formative and summative. Uh, in online er learning, uh, probably uh, the importance of uh, having effective strategies that can help students to forward to their uh, learning Pro, uh, progress is more important, uh, probably more important uh, because of the uh, um, not, uh, uh, have, because of the lack of the immediacy over there. Uh, so we would encourage putting more thoughts, uh, thinking about some more formative type of assessment, like the examples you provided over there, some, uh, some uh, 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 kind of, uh, for instance, uh, uh, self-check quizzes type, and uh, uh, even sometimes it might be just peer commenting um, and uh, uh, some self reports, some brainstorming activities, uh, informal checks, those kind of uh, activity, thinking about more, um, probably put more thoughts, especially if you're fully online course, uh, you have a, 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 well, limited, you know, a live session and you have, uh, um, a lot of, for instance, the asynchronous type of assessment uh, activities, you might thinking more um, to provide some more formative type of assessment. Next, please. Yeah, so for online assessment, um, share actually the same principles as other teaching modes. All the assessment here are uh, kind of listed, um, wh whether they are online, blended, or even uh, uh, exclusively face-to-face -face can, uh, can be guided by the same principles, uh, effect, uh, 
as the following, actually. Uh, the first one is evaluating learning processes. So this is a um, recommend moving away from evaluating your students' performance to evaluating the process. Uh, the next one is align assessment strategies. Basically, this one is align assessment with the learning outcomes and the teaching and learning activity. Um, the next one is authentic assessment strategies. So basically, that is a a kind of thinking about some uh, opportunities to apply uh, real world ideas, uh, use a variety of uh, assessment methods. So this is a, a, a kind of a reminder, not just a midterm and final with very heavy weights. Um, and uh, uh, the next is both a summative and, and formative. So here, uh, try to see a balance between the summative and the formative, uh, have some type, of, uh, some degree of the separation for uh, between the grades and the feedback uh, distributions for, for your overall design of your course. Um, provide multiple opportunities. This. Um, especially for online uh, courses, probably thinking uh, multiple opportunities for timely feedback um, on your students' learning progress. Um, so this timely feedback uh, it, it's, doesn't have to be, uh, you know, uh, always provided by instructors. It could be uh, using some features, uh, well, um, have some self-checked or set up a kind of a go hands in hand with the next uh, re uh, reminder there is uh, uh, having some type of self and peer assessments. Um, so that is uh, um, could provide enough opportunity for students to self and peer uh, reflect their learning process. So that is for students actually is a uh, for them to reflect on their own work and for instructors is uh, um, it could be uh, a way for you to try to balance and manage your instructor's uh, workload actually, uh, because actually for fully online course that you might find uh, it's a pretty, you know, um, uh, labor <laughs> intensive type of uh, uh, engagement in there for both students and for you as well. Uh, have transparent and clear expectations. Uh, this is especially for online class, um, uh, have to uh, put ahead of time some clear grading and um, criteria and the rubrics, the, those kind of uh, consideration. So these principles actually uh, encourage authenticity and the transparency uh, within the assessment practice. Next, please. So um, Anton asks, what is authentic? Still not sure what authentic assessment strategy means. Okay, so next slide, we okay. can tackle that. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, when you're thinking about authentic assessment, so, so what we highlighted here uh, are some features or, or examples of, of, of authentic assessment strategies. Uh, so uh, I'm just using a very simple one, okay? While I'm using case study, for instance, as an authentic assessment idea, right? Uh, to elaborate the features, uh, you can thinking about, okay, or you put down some notes, uh, some other authentic uh, assessment ideas you, that you might have in your mind uh, while, uh, while it, uh, we discuss. Um, so so if, you, if we thinking about, because a case study is uh, um, used across, uh, I mean, disciplines and the different type of courses. So when we're thinking about like case studies as of authentic ass assessment ideas, uh, when we design that uh, case study, then what we do is uh, we, we pick um, or make the case based on a real world real, uh, well, in situation, right? And uh, we use real life situations to make a case. And then we try to include activities uh, closely matching the real world tasks uh, to help students uh, well, uh, make connection uh, of their previous knowledge and skills and try to help them uh, to solve some real world problem, right? And along the way, we allow multiple uh, pathways for the solution for a specific uh, uh, problem, right? It's a kind of problem 
based learning as well. So uh, it's a authentic assessment is many, many times ill-defined um, and open-ended. Um, so it's kind of mirroring what is really uh, it, people could encounter in their real life and the highly engaging uh, opportunity that can help students to thinking uh, actually to foster their higher order thinking skills, right? So, uh, so this is just a one idea. So, so what some ideas come to your mind? Um, so keep a note. And then when we have a break down, uh, a break, breakout rooms activities, we would like you to share your ideas with uh, the participants here today. Um, and uh, uh, then uh, we would like to hear back from you later on, okay? Well, so because we I, sorry for interrupting, because this is really supposed to be Highland's part, but because I think I recognize a couple of you here in the audience, I've met you before. Um, for example, in medicine, um, there's a lot of, in, in, in addition to memorizing all the body parts and all the names of the different parts, the students need to learn how to apply that in a real, well, in a case situation where there's a, a patient with the different symptoms, now they need to solve that problem. So it's really real world, real life situation. And I imagine in Rita's course in Russian language, that she might also ask students to translate um, a piece of instructional manual, such as how to mentor your students um, or a, a translate a newspaper article into the Russian language. So again, taking real life example and helping them to make that connection from the individual vocabulary and grammar, the, the and um, and anatomy, the body parts, the, the nerve system and the drugs, and then putting them together to, to heal a patient, to get a Russian piece of newspaper article. So those, that's what we, um, that's to me, I think these are some real authentic assessment here in, in front of us in the audience. That's Sorry, cool. Hailan, I'll yeah. pass it no back problem. to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, on top of that, for instance, uh, some examples uh, for forestry is that uh, they pick up a, a half student to go to the field, uh, one in, uh, a kind of uh, go to the field school and then uh, uh, try to analyze uh, or kind of analyze the sites, how to manage the, re uh, the, the, the natural resources, those type of uh, activity, right? Okay, so we have some examples there. Okay, uh, the next slide, it's, uh, this one is uh, on the, uh, this slide. Uh, here's a list of the most commonly uh, used online assessment method. Uh, uh, here, have you used any of the, these strategies? Again, um, you are welcome to use the annotation tool again uh, to show us uh, what methods you are using uh, or plan to use for your uh, online class. Um, so um, so evidence-informed assessment actually uh, are key to improve the overall quality of the student's learning. Um, so there are many different ways of effective uh, assessment. Uh, so the most common ones, so uh, on the left-hand side are the most common ones uh, people usually uh, use, those most common ones. On the right-hand side, we list some of the uh, strategies that is collected from more experienced instructors. Um, so let's see what you are using right now. I can see, uh, so, so we can see online discussion is pretty uh, popular used uh, among you and online exams, uh, essay written assignments, uh, yeah, project and groups and e-portfolios, all right? So you touch all, almost all of them, right? For the commonly used ones. On the right-hand side, we can see uh, some of you have the, those new approaches, concept mapping, digital media projects, reflection, a uh, reflective type of uh, uh, writing or journaling, or even simulation activities. Okay, awesome. I thank you so much for sharing uh, what you are currently uh, doing. All right. 
uh, how about let's move on to the next. So with all, all this, uh, uh, any sets of the recommendations here, uh, not of the, all of them um, will be uh, helpful in a given situation. So you will have to make a uh, decision uh, which one of them uh, are the most uh, um, appropriate for your course maybe. So when you're thinking about the design of the uh, assessment is like you might thinking about the context, uh, workload, uh, and the availability of uh, teaching uh, uh, TAs, those kind of uh, practical issues. And uh, when transitioning uh, here, um, we list some uh, transitioning considerations of assessment when you, especially when you design online courses. Um, so uh, the first one is uh, have uh, front heavy preparation. Probably that's a reminder. These are just reminders here. So uh, because when you design, you're converting your face-to-face -to, -face to online. The first thing is you might want to reflect what to keep, right? What to, re uh, to remove or replace and some activities Activities that you designed on week might uh, is a uh, if you're face to face you might design them on on daily basis or a kind of like that. But when you move it online, uh, some activity you might thinking about uh, design it on weekly basis, uh, especially for asynchronous activities. Uh, so this will change uh, the overall design. So uh, so so we'll need. Uh, a, a kind of revised the detailed assessment descriptions, uh, rubrics, and the supporting resources, and actually uh, emphasize that is that uh, the, the procedures instructions should be clear for students. So you can see these is going to take time. Uh, the next one is a course in the media uh, organization. So this is about how, when you design for the fully online course, how to organize the course that helps students streamline um, your activities and assessment uh, and how to uh, uh, make the process uh, clear, simple, and actually is easy for a student to follow. Uh, the next one is uh, informal assessment opportunities, as uh, I, I just mentioned a little bit. Uh, so th this uh, may need to uh, thinking the balance of how much to, you want to ha have some breakdown activities or, uh, or formative assessment, right? Uh, need to um, uh, avoid both too many or too less. So, so uh, because actually we, we hear feedback from students saying that students are really struggling and frustrated to track and follow uh, so many uh, small deadlines for so many uh, online courses as simultaneously they are taking right now. So, so that is a, something, uh, a reminder um, and to, for you to thinking about. Uh, communication with students, this is about uh, assessment expectations, uh, to procedures and uh, how you are going to communicate that. So uh, we might uh, recommend uh, uh, use announcement, right? Uh, in, uh, well, instead of using email, uh, maybe the more effective ways announcement, discussion board, have a general Q and A, and uh, if you have live sessions, and the live sessions uh, could run um, on top of that. So, um, so help a uh, help a kind of uh, uh, do not uh, a kind of give a student um, uh, a, a kind of leave them frustrated with so many uh, uh, channels of communication. So that's another reminder. Um, and adjustment, adjustment time or opportunity, this basically uh, is about whenever uh, in uh, using a new lab uh, tool or application in your courses, uh, you want to implement your uh, assessment or activity ideas, uh, provide an opportunity for students to practice doing that ahead of time. Uh, so this might not just uh, for the final or, or midterm. So sometimes it's for some big uh, uh, projects you want a student to, um, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, accomplish. And then if you use any new tools, give them some opportunity to practice that. So these are just some reminders uh, as uh, you trans, uh, trans, uh, well, uh, uh, convert your courses for, for online. Okay, with that said, I'm uh, 
stopping here and try to see if you have questions uh, or not. Otherwise, I will hand it over to Judy. Thank you. I'm staying on this slide for now. I know I'm supposed to move on, but um, we are towards the end of the term now. We are hearing more and more from students. Um, one thing that they really want to know, um, one suggestion that we are hearing is the students really need to, I, I'm really, sorry, I'm really stuck at that part about accessible and easy to find instruction. Students are not able to find our instruction, it seems. Um, it could be very logical to us. It, to us, it's very easy to find. But I am really thinking that our students are taking four, five, six courses. Each one of us faculty members are organizing and using Canvas slightly different. I know in, in some faculty in art, there is a recommended templates that we should use, but our students are taking courses in science, in art, in, in and in for systems, in everywhere. Um, we, they see different way of organizing information. And some students may be so comfortable of receiving the information in the announcement, but they, and therefore they're looking for that instruction in the announcement. But if you decide not to do that, they will be lost. So a lesson that I'm learning from our students is that we need to keep repeating in different ways of what we expect them to do, the, all the deadline, all the instruction. So not just one simple logical way. It's logical to us, but it's not logical to them. And then another thing is, um, yeah, multiple multiple way of telling, telling the students what we are doing. And then the other thing that students are asking is a, a routine. You will have something post on Monday at this time. They need to do something by Thursday. And there's a something that will be due on the weekend. They, they want that routine every week. Like they, yeah, they, they just want a routine. So if you're still finalizing your course design for term two, I would like to ask you to remind you to think about these two latest lessons that I'm learning from our student right now. Okay, keep going. So I would like to share some examples at UBC um, on how our faculty member brings the real world and real life to the classroom, to the assessment strategies, and also what they are doing with the online environment. The first example, I'm going to use the example of online discussion. Many of us are familiar with the idea of having online discussion, but what is new in this course is, again, they are using um, slightly different in different courses in, in this four, I think it's forestry. Um, in 502, it started with a thought-provoking discussion. Okay? They've done the reading. They, they are supposed to have done the reading, but the faculty member is asking them something that is, bizarre, like this like, question that is debatable. So the students need to debate and share their thoughts. And then um, for 501, is a everyday life in the local use of the policy. There's something that's happening in the city um, and then in the, in the forest, in, in the province, and then they need to discuss it. It's stuff for everyday news. Um, so both of them are real, and ask for students to reflect on what they are seeing and apply them and talk about that with their colleagues, um, with their classmates. The, um, the technology being used is just the simple Canvas discussion board. Um, one thing that the faculty members are used doing to enhance academic integrity and also to make sure students are actually thinking, <laughs> they don't just simply say, oh, I agree with you, Peter. Hey, Susan, I really like your point. Without saying what they like about it, they just say, oh, I really like your idea. So students actually need to do a reflection, draft a post, and they need to post it before they can look at everyone else's um, discussion. Even though there is a chance of a repeated idea, you know, after they draft the thing, they recognize that that same idea has been expressed five times by other students but at least the students need to do their own reflection first. Um, 
In order to have meaningful discussion among the students, we recommend a smaller group. In, this, in these two classes, the group its size is less than 30. I personally find it still too big. Um, I would say, I would, I, I, I would recommend eight to 10 students in each group, even though they're talking about the same thing. Um, it, having eight to 10, you, you get to know everyone. You get to know who said what and what is their perspective. So then you can have a real discussion. Like even eight is too many, but I'm just afraid that if we keep this small group size too small, then it's too much monitoring to do. At the same time, what if there's a couple of students not contributing? So small group, um, so it's easy to have that meaningful discussion. So this is not something too unique. We are doing discussion, but just like small change of how we begin, start that conversation. What we can do is to start with a very controversial idea, a very local idea. And um, so online discussion, we've done that. And um, in terms of grading, I'm also hearing ideas about um, it's not, of course, we don't want to just tell the student you need, you need to post and then reply to each other three times, four times. Students are seeing it as busy work. They will just go in and say, I agree with you. I disagree with you. And just try to make that minimum expectation. So I'm hearing faculty members are now trying to ask in the final exam, in the midterm, ask them to summarize <laughs> What happened in the discussion thread? Ask them to reflect on the discussion topic again. So then they actually have to read that discussion um, so that they will draw on from that discussion and then put some final exam questions there at the end. Um, so don't just expect your students to respond three times, agree four times. That, that's not going to work. Students do not like it. My next example here is, again, nothing too new, research paper, research essay, but then now they just need to put the research paper online. Um, you might want to start with, you might even want to just start with in Canvas, okay? Student need to post something, they need to be shared by your uh, classmate, you can set up groups so then students will see a few others and comment on the research paper. You can have your own classroom block where, um, or you can even have password protection. So only students in your class can go into the block to look at the research paper. Um, if you're ready, if you trust your students, and if also, also to protect students' privacy. If your topic is not too controversial, then you may actually open this for um, everyone to look at. So you're on regular class block. I'm saying it because I'm being careful because each one of us will be teaching something different. And some of the topic that we are talking, that we discuss here in Canada, may be a illegal topic you are in, we are engaging our students to do something that is illegal in the country where they are joining us from. So um, if you wanted to ask your students to post something more controversial online, um, be pay attention to the privacy around the globe, <laughs> not just in Vancouver. Um, but password protected block will be a useful place I, I find that as soon as the student find out that the work they're going to contribute, that they're going to submit, is not just going to be read by TAs and yourself. Um, the, the, the paper that they're going to submit will be viewed by the classmate, will be viewed by past students in your course or future students in your course. The quality just go higher. And of course, if you can actually, in if you can, right? I mean, again, talking about the, the privacy legal, legality, if you can actually open this to the world, students' quality work, they, they pay, they, they work harder because they care. They know that the parents, the friends will be reading the research paper. 
The future employee may also be reading their paper. This is something that they can put on their resume. So they, they work harder and we end up getting better quality research paper. So again, nothing too different. It's still just a research paper, um, but because it's online, then we may ask them to add more image, more link, um, but finding a way to ask the students to, finding a way to ask the students to put it on in the real world. I'm thinking about, again, I'm thinking about the Russian course or any language course. I would really strongly suggest that you ask the students to contribute to the Russian version of the Wikipedia. Um, I, in my course, I ask students to contribute to Wikipedia English version um, on, on the subject matter that we teach. So again, putting the work outside in the real environment. So two cases here. Um, um, Holocaust artifact S8, students are sharing what they find and put it online. Um, video game law is actually a little bit more controversial because it's a discussion. Students need to express the opinion. So this can get quite risky, but this is a law course. So I think I trust that the faculty member knows what he's doing. Um, I, uh, I, yeah, I think I, I would be really careful if I expect my student to express an opinion on a controversial matter for my, for my students in my subject matter. Um, and an example here will be, come on, I cannot scroll. Yeah, here. Um, Yipopolio, digital media, again, creating something that the students can use it elsewhere. Um, here is a website. You, we have the link in the PowerPoint deck, so you can get the link later. Um, this is a website that is de developed by Christine Onofrio. She's from digital media and art. Um, she teaches art history, and she also teach digital media. So this is a very appropriate format for her course. Um, but what I really like about this is I, I use it myself sometimes. I allow my students to present their research paper. Let's say just keep it with research paper, to present the research finding in different format. It doesn't need to be as an academic traditional research paper. They can do a video. They can make a pamphlet. They can make a media guide, um, infographic, pressy, different way to present the learning. Again, um, I, again, because I also teach in a course that is an elective course, I imagine that not every one of my students will become an academic in my discipline. So I really want students to be able to create something that they can use. And I also really want to recognize my students' talent outside of what I'm teaching. I, I use in my course, I used to have a, group, a cohort of students from film, um, Antoine. I have a group of students from film. They, they must walk to my class together. There's a group of 20 and then they, they, they come and they love that video um, production of the research paper. They, they put in so much effort. There's the sound and the music. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased. So you recognize the talent. Start with something small. They give the thumb, they, they love it. The, the list of credit, you know, like at the end of the movie or the TV that goes up, my students, who the student who's involved in that video production, they, they get pages and pages of credit. They even credit the music that they use. I'm like, I don't even know how to cite music myself. Interesting. So the student find that the, the instructor recognized that other talent outside of academia. So, uh, uh, so I was reading the chat, so I get a little sidetracked. So using different way to ask students to show their learning. And Christine, in her website, she provided rubric, um, instructions, things that you need to know when you need to assign digital media assignment. So lots of resources there. Um, highly recommend, recommend it to you for if you're considering this type of format, this way of gathering evidence of the learning. I mentioned this earlier, Wiki. Um, 
we have two different types of wiki here. We have UBC own wiki, and then there's also the Wikipedia. Similar to what I mentioned before, students can post the research finding on the wiki. And um, UBC wiki, we have a lot more flexibility. You can structure your wiki pages any way you want for your own course. Um, and here in this Conservation 200 course, they are looking into a, a, some issues in different part of the world. There's local, locally applicable issues around the world. And then the students need to make suggestions on actions that they need to take to help with that conservation challenge. Um, as open, again, I mentioned this before, as open assessment, it encourages students to do well, perform. And one thing that we recognize, we've been, we've been using UBC Wiki for many years now, but recently we find out that we, we, we should know, but we never pay attention to that. Um, when they log into the UBC Wiki, it's associated with the CWL and therefore the information that they contribute is also um, associated with the personal information. So um, if, we, if you are going to ask the students to talk about something more controversial and you worry about the ripple effect 10 years later, then we can also help the students to get an alias if you want to ask them to do UBC Wiki project. Wikipedia, um, I tell the students to find, use a name that is not associated with themselves. Like chocolate lover, for example, um, just make up my name and then tell me in Canvas what, what the username is so I can mark them accordingly. Um, one last one. I think this is really authentic now. This one is really authentic and I am surprised. I just heard information this earlier this morning. Um, this is community work. So students need to work with community members to solve a problem, to help them investigate an issues that is happening in the community. Um, we have courses in that info system that the whole course, everything is built on community work. And um, you can go to the website, the web course web page above LFS 250 or 350 language.ubc.ca. The students also need to document the process, how they meet with the community member, what they learn from the first meeting, uh, identify the challenge, and then the whole proposal, the whole research investigation, and then they with the with the consents from the community member, because sometimes it's not if there's private information that we need to respect. Um, with the consents from the community members, we sometimes will have the final product, the, the essay, the infographic, the poster post online there too. So so welcome to take a look. So in this, this morning, I was at a meeting. Um, there's actually an increased need uh, request um, from UBC faculty wanting to do more community work during COVID. I was a little surprised because I thought, oh, nobody wants to do it. We don't want to go out to the community. We may not want to interact with people as much as before because in the, in the past, students need to go out, meet the community members. Um, but I, I find out from the, the Center for Community Engaged Learning that there's actually a higher demand. Faculty members would like the students to perhaps at least virtually meet them through Zoom to, to, to meet. Maybe, maybe technology is helping us to reach out to them. We don't actually need to go there in person, um, perhaps. But there's an increased need. But this one takes a lot of work. If you really want your student to start to work in the community, I would say start thinking about it now and plan it for next September. I wouldn't recommend it for January. It's, it's a lot of work. Um, but students, are, they are applying. They're making a difference in the community. And, and that's authentic. That's good. Uh, focus on three questions. Uh, thinking about uh, how can you add some real world examples or ideas uh, using that specific method and uh, any challenge uh, for implement your ideas using uh, uh, what type of tool you are thinking about implement 
that idea and uh, how uh, what, uh, you might thinking about taking care of some academic integrity um, well, uh, issues. Closing thoughts, we would like to say that assessment is a way, is not the end of learning. Assessment should be used as a way to encourage students that the continual growth they, uh, and, and encourage them to wanting to learn more. That's what Highland and I hope that that's the primary goal of assessment is helping them to, do, to learn more. And with our closing thought is we want to ask you what, what are you going to do next? Where can you find more information to prevent the cheating? Where can you find information to help you redesign your assessment? So then like scaffolding, we, we heard about that from one of you earlier. Um, what are you going to do next? Between now and, and the Christmas break, I hope that you will all have a break too. So feel free to put it in the chat or just have a reflection, put it in your notebook. What are you going to do next? <laughs> Moving on, while you are doing that reflection and making that determination of what you're going to do next, um, we wanted to let you know all the resources, all the, there's some rubrics here and link to all the courses that we introduced. Um, we try to link it to as close to the assessment as possible so that you don't think, need to stick around too much. And um, feel free to share everything that you heard, you learned from each other, um, from us mainly, because this is um, with, with other colleagues. And oops, Thailand and I, we are happy and our colleagues are also happy to have one-on-one -on -one consultation with you. Um, there are times that we will pass you over. We will suggest you to talk to someone else just because I, I call myself a generalist in, in CTLT. We do have colleagues who are more specialized in different areas. So they will be better able to support you for your need. So we might need to say, hey, we will introduce you to a different colleague. Not that because we don't like you. Okay. Um, so thank you, Antoine, for putting your next steps here. And there's also a feedback form. Hainan and I would love to hear what works for you, what didn't work for you. And then so we will continue to refine and modify our plan, our facilitation plan. And we will also like to know what type of workshop we should offer in spring, in, in January. So we call, I like to call it spring. And um, we will have drop-in session next week at CTLT. So you are welcome to bring your questions to our drop-in session. I think Highlands team will also be offering some more additional consultation sessions for you to drop in to ask questions during the first week of January. I hope that by this time, you should all know that class of most classes being very mindful about who's in the audience. Most classes will be starting in on January 11th instead of the 4th. So with that said, I thank you very much for your participation. We will stick around for a couple more minutes in case you have any questions.